Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Donald Rothwell. I'm Professor of International Law here at the ANU College of Law, and it's my um, pleasure to welcome you to this uh, simple event uh, this evening titled Artemis and the Moon and International Law uh, Conundrum. Uh, before I commence, I want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past uh, and present. Uh, can I can also acknowledge the uh, Director of CIPL, Lake McDonald, who's here uh, this evening. And um, I was saying to someone just a few minutes ago that this is actually a fairly significant event because uh, nearly 52 weeks ago, um, the ANU Vice-Chancellor sent an email to all members of staff and students saying that we effectively had 48 hours to evacuate the campus because the campus was going to be closed down as a result of COVID. Um, so it's a, a great delight to be able to uh, physically be chairing an event uh, with those of you present, but also uh, those of you who are, who are engaging uh, online uh, via Zoom uh, from around the country. So um, the format this evening is that we have we have two speakers and they'll each make um, brief presentations and then I will engage them uh, in conversation uh, and then we'll open up for uh, Q&A and we'd like to allow at least 20 minutes, hopefully about 30 minutes for uh, questions on this really uh, fascinating topic. So our two speakers uh, this evening, first um, to my right is my colleague, uh, Dr. Cassandra Sophia, who's a mission specialist with the ANU Institute of Space, which is also known locally as InSpace, but most importantly for us here as a senior lecturer at the ANU College of Law, uh, specializing in space law, space security, and international law. Uh, Cassandra came to the college uh, last year, very brave of you, Cassandra, for coming to us. Uh, during the midst of the pandemic, you didn't know that at the time that you accepted your offer. Um, but Cassandra came to us from, from North America, where she held uh, several positions at McGill and at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and had previously undertaken studies uh, focusing on international criminal law, uh, but more recently has moved into looking at space law. And we're delighted that she's been able to join us, uh, especially uh, the way in which she's been able to bring a burst of enthusiasm our studies and engagement in, in space law and, and Cassandra has been one of the driving forces behind uh, this evening's event. Uh, the other speaker we have uh, joining us remotely, uh, but we're very pleased to have with us is Professor uh, Melissa Bizuart, uh, who's the Dean of Law at Adelaide Law School at the University of Adelaide. Um, prior to joining academia, Melissa was a, a legal manager at CSIRO, where she specialised in technology transfer and licensing of intellectual property. Uh, Melissa taught in the undergraduate and postgraduate programs at Monash University for 13 years and has a special interest in copyright, digital technology, social networking, virtual communities, and online games. But most importantly, for our purposes, uh, outer space and space law. And uh, I want to acknowledge the collaboration between the ANU College of Law and Adelaide Law School over quite a number of years and looking uh, into our military law program. And we're delighted, Melissa, to have you. Uh, join us here uh, this evening. So um, our discussion this evening is uh, the Artemis Accords and the Moon, and the focus of our deliberations is really the developments that occurred uh, in 2020, uh, with NASA uh, announcing the promotion of the Artemis Accords. Uh, initially, there wasn't a great deal of information about what precisely NASA was proposing. And then as we got towards the end of uh, 2020, we actually saw the release of the Artemis Accord uh, text. Uh, and we also saw announcements in terms of a number of countries uh, signing on to the Artemis Accords, uh, including Australia. And I guess that's the catalyst for our deliberations and discussions this evening, because the conundrum that we're posing is, well, how do the Artemis Accords sit comfortably alongside Australia's uh, international legal obligations. And to that end, uh, one of the key aspects that we're interested in is Australia being, of course, a party to the, the Moon Agreement. So we'll unpack uh, all of those issues in my initial discussions with uh, Cassandra and Melissa. Um, so Cassandra, I'll invite you to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Don, and thank you for chairing it. And Melissa, I'm really excited to see you, even if it's only virtually. We're looking at her behind you all, by the way, so we're going to have to keep doing this. We've got two of you here. Um, um, 
So, um, and it was actually in discussions with John that we decided to hold this event. Um, so, Artemis, let me take you into the world of Greek mythology, um, was uh, the, the, one of the daughters, one of the many children of Zeus. Uh, she was the goddess of the hunt of wild animals. She was also the goddess of the moon. Um, she said to Zeus when she was young, I never want to wear a long dress. I want to have a short dress so I can run and hunt and climb things. I never want to marry because I never want to be the property of any man. Uh, and Zeus was so impressed, he gave her uh, a bow and arrows, which were um, arrows of fire. Um, so, uh, in fact, my partner and I loved this story so much that we named our daughter after me, which is the French spelling. Um, and we thought, what an incredible story, what an incredible legacy we've given her. 11 months later, when she was 11 months old, NASA announced its Artemis program. And I thought, everyone's going to think I named my daughter after the NASA program, but it was the other way around. <laughs> um, but the fact that they chose this name, because Artemis was also the twin sister of Apollo. And of course, the Apollo project was the project that brought uh, humans to the moon for the, for the first time uh, in 1960. 69. So they named it the Artemis program because one of its key intentions is to bring humans back to the moon and to put the first woman on the moon. So it's actually a very apt name, uh, the goddess of the moon. Um, and I also think, though that's often not referred to in media, it's often referred to she was Apollo's twin sister, the fact that she was the goddess of the moon, the fact that she said, I will be the property of no man, of no, no person, um, is, is really key to the discussions that we're here to have tonight. So um, the Artemis Accords are bilateral accords, they're by invitation only. The US decides who it wants to invite to be part of its programs to return to the moon. Part of that program is also to mine resources on the moon, hence my reference to the fact that she said, I never want to be the property of any man. Um, and because of the geopolitical tensions around any activity in space, but particularly where technology is taking us, so um, natural resource extraction in space is becoming the next uh, tension point, the next place of commercial competitiveness, and the next place where we start to try and figure out um, is this possible under international space law? So our key treaty in space law is the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, one of the core provisions of which, and I'm sure Melissa and I will have the chance to talk more about the history of that treaty, but one of the core provisions of that treaty is that there is no sovereignty in outer space. There is no, no national by means of, um, of um, sovereignty or by occupation or by any other means. States cannot own space, they cannot own uh, celestial bodies that includes the moon, planets, asteroids. Um, and so, and now we're seeing companies and countries wanting to extract resources, claim ownership over those resources, use them, sell them. And so the whole, the whole debate is, is this possible under the Outer Space Treaty? Uh, and the, the key provision, there, so there are several provisions in the Artemis Accords, some of them are fantastic, some of them have to do with um, the fact that we need to ensure all of our activities are in accordance with the Outer Space Treaty, that there is international cooperation, uh, that there is interoperability of the technologies being developed, so whether you're part of the NASA program or perhaps a future European program, um, there has to be technological interoperability so that we don't have problems with trying to stick bits together and figure out how to survive in space. Um, exchange of technology, uh, peaceful purposes, so that's another core provision of the Outer Space Treaty that, that these activities have to be for peaceful purposes, they cannot be used to wage war essentially for aggressive purposes. Um, we have to think about space debris once we move our activities further away from Earth and to the Moon. So all of these provisions are really important, but we have two provisions which are controversial, one of which uh, is uh, um, Section 10 of the Outer Accords, which says Natural resource extraction can and shall take place and is in accordance with the Outer Space Treaty. So in signing this agreement, Australia and the other seven countries that have signed it say, we agree with this particular interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty. So I have a few concerns about this. One of them is the process. Um, we are no longer in a multilateral, uh, excuse me, a unilateral reality. We're, we're, we're in a new multi, multilateral reality, political reality. So there's concerns for multilateralism and in our international institutions that were born out of the 20th century. There's concerns about recommitting to an international rules-based order, but we're not quite sure who's making those rules or perhaps even what some of those rules are. Um, and when we have one country determining who can be 
in, it, in the club or who is excluded from that club. When you're talking about interpretations of international law, that raises concerns for me. Of course, the US gets to determine who it wants to have as part of its NASA program. Of course, it gets to determine who it shares technology with. But if in the course of that, you are saying, we are a club who interprets international law this way, and you're either in or out of that club, that has repercussions. Um, it reflects you know, critiques about how international law has developed as a very Western-oriented project in the, in the 20th century and the 21st century. Um, and it reflects, reflects concerns that were raised um, so earlier in between sort of 2008 and 2015, there was an attempt to come up with a non-binding international agreement uh, that would lay down some rules of behavior about what is responsible behavior in space. We want to avoid uh, military and political tensions. We want to set some ground rules about what responsible behavior is because let me also say, we are so dependent on space for our 21st century lives. We're all using it every single day in, in many, when you use your ATM to do banking, when you make phone calls, when you're on the internet, all of this is space. Um, and we have problems of access to space, we have problems of space debris. So we need to make sure we have um, rules in, in place. So this process was called the International Code of Conduct. It completely failed, not because the rules were disagreed upon, but because when it almost came to a process of consensus and negotiation at the UN, a number of countries, particularly non-aligned countries and uh, countries with a smaller economic base and influence said, this has been an EU process. We've been excluded, we want no part of it. So it stalled. Now, if this process, which is coming from one key power, which is saying, you must agree with our interpretation of international law, particularly on these very contentious issues, it's excluding all of those countries which are saying we're having difficulty having access to space. Um, the Outer Space Treaty also guarantees right of access to space, equal uh, benefit from, from activities in space. They're being locked out. And so the process is one of the things I have the biggest, um, the biggest issue with. Um, I have more to say about the history of how the Artemis Accords came in, into being, but um, I should leave it there and allow Melissa to, to add her comments. Thanks, Cassandra. I think it might be immediately useful um, if you would just to clarify, because um, and we all know that the Artemis Accords were promoted uh, in 2020 um, by the Trump administration. Has there been any change with the uh, Biden administration being in place in terms of their position with respect to the Artemis Accords? No, not at all. And so the, these are uh, a NASA instrument, and the, the space agency of the US drafted the instrument, promoted the instrument, and sought out signatories from the space agencies of other countries. So they're agreements between the space agencies. They're not agreements between the executive, uh, the head of state, for instance, and the foreign, um, um, the DFAT in Australia. Um, and so there's no reason for them to change their position on it. If I can abuse the fact that you've given the floor back to me. <laughs> um, so one of the other concerns, however, has come from previous administrations. In 2015, under the Obama administration, the US passed a law called the Space Competitiveness Act, in which they also asserted natural resource extraction can take place. Any Australian, uh, Australian any American company um, that, that has a first claim of right, we will protect that, that company. And so they asserted a national right under international law, and that's exactly the contentious interpretation. So there was a bit of discussion and debate and kickback from international lawyers, but it was a domestic law. In 2020, there was a presidential order, Trump presidential order, in which he stated, the US does not consider space to be a global commons. And that raises all sorts of red flags. Um, and then the Artemis Accords were announced. So although there are NASA instruments, and although they're mostly focused on scientific and technological engagement, when you put it in that context, that, that those are the concerns. So I don't think the Biden administration will do anything to change the Artemis program or these accords, but we all have to see them in that wider context. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, Lisa, hopefully you're able to hear us all AIK, -okay, and we look forward to um, your initial uh, remarks. Thank you. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, and maybe I'll just get the same acknowledgement uh, back from you. Okay, great, thank you. So I would like to uh, just uh, uh, acknowledge that I am coming to you from Ghana land and to pay my own respects to the traditional owners of the Adelaide Plains uh, upon which the Adelaide University is built. And particularly to acknowledge that 
the importance and indeed the, the magic of space has always been important to the traditional owners of the land and is something that we can cherish and, and learn from. Uh, I would also like to apologise in advance if you hear any noise, because I'm also sitting in the middle of peak hour traffic in Adelaide, which lasts for about four and a half minutes. So probably the duration of what I'm <laughs> going to speak to you tonight. So um, it's really great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this presentation. It's wonderful to particularly be working with you, Cassandra, and it's great to have you back. Uh, in Australia, I have known Cassandra for, for many years and the, the problem has always been she's been too far away. So it's great to have you, have you back. So I suppose that the Artemis Accords are something that will uh, create plenty of opportunities for law review articles and plenty of opportunities for debate. But I would like to focus, I suppose, on what I see as some of the, the more positive aspects of the Artemis Accords and to particularly focus on what is, I suppose, different about the Artemis Accords. So recent years have seen a renewed interest in a return to the moon. And of course, I'm particularly excited about the fact that there is a plan to land the first female on the moon. Um, but it's not only the US that's been uh, placing an emphasis on a return to the moon. Both China and Israel have dispatched lunar missions in 2019. So you had the Chinese landing a lunar rover in um, January. And then you had the Israeli mission uh, somewhat unfortunately crash landing on the surface of the moon and potentially uh, distributing uh, DNA samples and tardigrades on the moon's surface without permission. So there's still quite a lot of reckless behavior going on. And uh, more recently, we have seen announcements of a joint Russian-Chinese base, which is proposed by the moon. Now, what is interesting about these renewed uh, missions to the moon are the fact that they are heavy, heavily reliant upon um, commercial space operators. So once upon a time, um, we know that space operators were uh, NASA, and so you had uh, large single purpose missions that were funded uh, by governments. But now these things can only occur with the involvement of commercial operators. And that is very much why the Artemis Accords um, recognize these new principles such as interoperability, which I, I will get onto in a minute. Um, notably, I think, you know, one of the highlights of, of 2020, um, which unfortunately took place at a sort of unfortunate time in, in history in America was when you had the successful um, crewed mission to the International Space Station, which was undertaken by SpaceX, um, which launched uh, from American soil on the 30th of May 2020. And that was the first launch of American astronauts from the US soil since the demise of the Space Shuttle program in 2011. But notable, of course, that this was done by a private operator. So it's unsurprising that NASA has announced that its return to the moon and potentially beyond um, will involve um, commercial and by necessity international partners. So as uh, uh, space lawyers know that whilst these activities are undertaken by private uh, or commercial operators under the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty, which Cassandra has introduced you to, it means that um, the relevant state will bear international responsibility for those activities. And these include principles such as authorization and continuing supervision of those activities, as well as importantly, international liability for any damage caused by, for example, a space object. And the Outer Space Treaty itself anticipates that states will inform um, the way in which they will choose to conform with the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty, most likely through the enactment of domestic space laws, and that's certainly what we have chosen to do in Australia. However, of course, these provisions leave lots of questions uh, unanswered, and particularly because this is a very um, new development, is how will national space agencies engage in the process of supervision and how will national space agencies engage in working together with private space corporations and then moving beyond that how will private space corporations from different uh, countries work together so there is a bit of precedent in, in this area probably the most successful example that comes to mind is the international space station 
um, and that's operated pursuant to an intergovernmental agreement. So yay for contract law, um, it reigns supreme here. And that agreement addresses many questions which are left unanswered by international space law, such as things like ownership and use of intellectual property on the ISS. And it is anticipated by the Artemis project uh, that the Gateway project, which is uh, one of the sort of preliminaries to the, the human landing on the moon, that the um, intergovernmental agreement will be essentially extended under, and art, under Artemis to the Gateway project. So the hope is that states through their relevant agencies will be able to advance perhaps the filling in of or the key legal issues applicable to the future uses of space. Just briefly, I think that perhaps the context within which the Artemis Accords themselves were announced was somewhat unfortunate, obviously living under the difficulties in extremists that were being encountered during the latter months of the Trump regime and the, the political discord and uh, all of the social conditions that were occurring at the time, um, it was, it's very hard, very difficult environment to get positive news stories out. And uh, as Cassandra has already alerted you to, there were some executive orders made by the Trump administration that made fairly sweeping um, statements about um, what the attitude of the US government was towards international space law. So certainly there was pronouncements such as the US does not consider the moon agreement to be an effective or necessary instrument to guide nation states regarding the promotion of commercial participation in long-term exploration, scientific discovery, use of the moon, Mars or other celestial bodies and concluded that the moon agreement does not reflect customary international law. And the US is certainly not on its own in that conclusion. Um, as Cassandra has already said, um, Australia is one of the few signatories of um, the Moon Agreement. And I'm not, I'm not gonna risk doing sh screen share with you now, but thanks to my wonderful uh, research assistant, Michelle, I can give you a fairly graphic, I think, understanding of how many uh, nations have actually uh, signed the Moon Agreement. So this is the list of signatories to the Moon Agreement and the following pages really demonstrate all of the nations that are not signatories to the Moon Agreement. So I will leave it up to you whether you agree or disagree with the US conclusion about customary international law. Um, but just to conclude on that point, of course the issue is how can Australia as a signatory to the Moon Agreement then sign the Artemis Accords? I have made myself somewhat unpopular by directly asking this question. And I think that the current position of the space agency is that there is no inconsistency between being Australia being uh, a signatory to the Moon Agreement because of the provisions, and we probably will want to dig into this in a bit more detail, so I'll just flag it briefly now, because of the provisions in the Moon Agreement that contemplate that a regime will be uh, established pursuant to Article 11, um, which will govern the exploitation of natural resources of the moon and so forth. So I agree, Cassandra, that when I heard this, I thought, well, Australia is never going to be part of Artemis. Like all of our commercial space providers can, can wave goodbye to being part of the uh, Artemis project, but we have signed, the, the Australian Space Agency has signed the Moon to Mars Partnership MOU with NASA. And uh, as we now know, we've also joined up to the Artemis Accord. So we are in, I think, a very interesting position. Thanks, uh, Melissa. So let's just turn to some very basic uh, international law issues. I appreciate that not everyone here might have a background in international law. Um, Cassandra and I have been having a bit of an exchange about the fact that this instrument is called the Artemis Accords. Uh, I'll ask for a comment from you, Melissa, in a moment, but, um, but Cassandra, what's your understanding as to how we interpret these accords consistent with uh, basic principles of international law and especially the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties? Um, and so given that not everyone here is an international lawyer, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties 
tells us um, what is a treaty, how do we interpret treaties, how they bind countries, um, what you do when there's a breach. Um, and the definition of a treaty in, in Article 2 is that it must be written instruments. I see some of my international law students smiling right now because this is their constant um, it, it must be an ex a written instrument um, with uh, an expression of a consent to be bound. Um, you know, other parts of it say it has to be, we assume it has to be the executive. If not, it has to be someone representing the government who's given full powers to bind the state by signing this agreement. It usually has to be ratified into domestic law as well in order to have force under domestic law. And in Australia, we have uh, Jay Scott, the um, help me out, the, the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. So they have to go through and um, and approve the text of the treaty before it becomes Australian law as well. Um, the Artemis Accords. So you can have a treaty that's called an accord. It doesn't matter if we call it an agreement or an accord or, or a treaty. But the Artemis Accords, Section 13 says. Uh, the US will deposit this with the, with the UN so that everyone can see the text and see who signed it, but it is not eligible under the Charter of the UN to be registered as a treaty. And NASA's position is it is not a treaty. It is a bilateral agreement. It is not a treaty. Therefore, it isn't subject to all of these interpretations of the Vienna, Vienna Convention. Therefore, you could also argue, so there's our obligation as a moon agreement um, uh, so they have a treaty called an agreement. The Moon Agreement, Article 11.5 says, we are obliged, as soon as the technology to extract resources in space looks feasible, we are obliged to set up an international legal regime to govern that. And yet we've signed this Artemis Accord saying, these activities can take place under the, under the Outer Space Treaty, those are a problem. Um, you could say the fact that the Accords are not a treaty means we don't have a problem of a clash of obligations. Um, but I would argue that what we have, if the Accords, they're not a treaty, and, and I guess the fact that the authors of the Accord and the signatories have said it is not our intent that this is a treaty, it must prevail. Um, but we have made a, a signed binding bilateral agreement. You could say perhaps it's even a binding unilateral declaration, which is what my argument is. We have now stated publicly that we bind ourselves to this interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty. And that's what creates this conundrum. We are the only country in the world that is a signatory to both of these instruments. Thanks for explaining that. Um, and, and just for the benefit of everyone, um, we have referred to the Moon Agreement. Um, the Moon Agreement is clearly a, a treaty for the purposes of the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. Uh, and that agreement was uh, Included in 1979, um, and its entry into force for Australia uh, was 1986. Um, and you can find the Moon Agreement uh, reproduced in the Australian Treaty Series 1986, number 14. So the crux of the conundrum is that Australia has treaty obligations under the, the Moon Agreement, has treaty obligations under other aspects of international space law. And we're trying to ascertain in, in some of this debate and discussion how that can be reconciled with the Artemis Accords. Uh, Alyssa, um, any thoughts that you have on that particular issue? So the provision uh, relating to the resource extraction makes an observation about the necessity essentially uh, for the ability to extract and to use resources um, for the further exploration and use of space. And I think that is that is an accepted principle um, that in order to go further into the solar, solar system, we will need to use water and uh, uh, fuel from m the moon, asteroids, etc. cetera. Uh, and then asserts that that extraction and utilization can be, can be done um, but will be done under the auspices of the Outer Space Treaty. So the Artemis Accords themselves repeat that the context within which these accords are expressed are within the broader framework of the Outer Space Treaty. So it, it doesn't purport to do anything that is outside of the Outer Space Treaty. The difficulty that we, we have is that the Outer Space Treaty itself leaves a lot of, to be generous, grey areas, a lot of gaps. And, of course, that's because it was drafted 
in a particular time for a particular purpose. And so the argument by NASA is that, that it is not intended to do anything other than essentially to fill in the gaps. It is in accordance with international law. And they are also very clear to say that because of the bilateral nature of these agreements, that each of the partners in the Artemis Accords may choose to undertake activities insofar as it is in compliance with their own domestic legal con context. So the Australian Space Agency would also say that, that they would say, well, we know that Australia has obligations under the Moon Agreement and we participate in Artemis to the extent that it would not place us in breach of any of our international arrangements. So it's a very, <laughs> it's a very complicated house of cards that we're building there, but everybody is, is still saying we are acting in compliance with international law. Melissa, can I um, ask a quick follow-up? Um, is perhaps another way to characterise the Accords is really just an interagency agreement between the Australian Space Agency and NASA in, in the same way that the AFP would have interagency agreements with their counterparts uh, around the world? And presumably through your work with CSIRO, you would know that, that they would have had equivalent type of agreements. I guess the, the distinction here is that none of them have been perhaps... Uh, so public and, and out there in the public domain. It is definitely an interagency agreement and, and quite consciously so, and that's how the space agency would view it. Uh, I think that it is to be applauded, I think, for the fact that it is open. So, as I said, we know that Russia and China are looking to um, develop uh, a settlement of some kind on the moon and it is not clear what their intentions will be once they are there. So the issue that we have here is at least we're being uh, told that what the rules are that they will apply. And that's essentially what they're saying. Well, we're saying these are the rules that we're going to apply. Anyone else is welcome to come along and, and abide by these rules as well. So I think the transparency part is to be applauded, but certainly it is at least opening up that conversation about we know that resource extraction is going to occur so what are the rules that will apply to it once it does occur or before it occurs so i guess melissa that raises some issues for um, australian industry and i'll come to you and then ask for cassandra's views on that matter um, do you think that australia australia's industry uh, the space industry needs any further clarity uh, on this as a matter of securing uh, investment that they'll be making into developing technologies for the Artemis program? Well, commercial investment always requires certainty. So I think absolutely so. I think that what they will be looking for is for the agency really to clarify which elements of Artemis or Moon to Mars that Australia will actually be taking part in. So what I think will happen, though, is that the agency will essentially open it up to industry to make that call. So you have a, we, we have a, an agency that operates in a different way to NASA. Uh, we have a much smaller space agency. I frankly think they need to be a lot better resourced than they are. I think they, they perform an incredibly important role. Um, but how far they can go in a sense in terms of coordinating or managing industry as part of the project, I think will only be very small. But certainty, yes, industry always likes certainty. Thank you, Cassandra. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, industry needs certainty. And I, and I think, so there are some aspects of being part of the Artemis program, which are just unproblematic and, and it's great and we should forge ahead. But, um, you know, we are part of a very small club of signatories to this moon agreement. <clears throat> Other countries include um, Peru, the Philippines, Morocco. I mean, they're not huge space powers, right? Um, it was a treaty that was um, negotiated at a time when, so that the Antarctic Treaty had recently been negotiated, there were concerns about non-aligned countries and developing countries being able to access areas where resources are being contested, like the Antarctic, like the, the international waters. And the perspective of that happening on the moon was what um, generated the negotiation of this treaty. But um, it's a very small club of not particularly huge hitting powers who, and, and Australia now has an obligation to set up an international legal regime. And I do think industry wants to know 
Is Australia going to take steps to do so? What might that regime look like? How effective can it be? How can we get buy-in from other countries such that it is an effective regime, even if they're not signatories to the Moon Agreement? Because that legal regime will affect their activities if they are involved specifically in these kinds of activities. So they will need to know what Australia's stance is on that. Is Australia going to be proactive in, in triggering setting up this international regime? Or are we just going to sit around and hope that no one tells us, hey, you've got this obligation? Um, so, so that aspect of it, I do think, you know, not every, not every um, uh, company that's part of the commercial space sector in Australia is interested in those specific kinds of technologies. There are other things that we can be uh, and already are looking at doing as part of the, the Artemis program. But, but if they're interested in those technologies, that's where we have our problem. So Melissa, I'll come back to you and then I'll open the, the floor up for discussion. Um, so Cassandra has raised this issue about what role, if any, that Australia should take in developing an international legal regime and or governance body <coughs> for natural resource extraction in space? What's, what's your, view, your view on that? Well, I'm not sure that I agree with Cassandra that, that the obligation rests with us. I think it's arguable and I think it's a good argument, but I think we, uh, we would try and avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> becoming our obligation. Uh, I think that there could be an argument made that this is, in fact, the beginning of that international regime. Now, you know, Cassandra knows as well as I do that there have been a number of other attempts to develop uh, a regime. Um, and we've had the Working Party in The Hague looking at it as well. Um, but I think that on the plus side, I think Australia is well-placed to take a role in this. We have been part of uh, the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Out of Space before it was even a permanent committee. I think we're regarded as being a uh, good global citizen. We're certainly very keen to sign up to treaties, so we've got good track record on that. And we have a breadth of expertise in space law as well as um, a significant sort of depth of legal knowledge with to, to do with resource extraction. So I think we have the right expertise to play a leadership role in that. And I think we are well regarded on the international stage as being capable of doing that. And uh, the, the only limitation that I would make to that is, again, I would say that it is likely that the space agency itself would not regard that as being part of their obligation. They, they have a fairly narrow remit, so it would fall outside of the scope of what the space agency itself would be doing and back onto the Australian government. Thank you. So what we're going to do is, is open it up now to questions, and uh, we can certainly take questions from the floor. We invite those, uh, from those of you who are here. Uh, we can also take uh, questions via Zoom, which will be shuffled uh, through to me, uh, and I will repeat them for the benefit of uh, those uh, online and also uh, in the, uh, within the room. So any, any questions that we can take? Yes, please. Um, I have a question, which might be a very silly question, but as far as resource extraction goes versus the extraction of scientific samples, do any of the treaties stipulate a quantity or an amount or what's, what sort of is the line that they draw between scientific samples and resource extraction, particularly in the space where it's something that's not um, monitored by as many people as it is sort of on Earth? <coughs> Can you restate the question so that people can hear? So, so the, the, the question related to issues in terms of uh, resource extraction and, and the way in which that might be managed uh, under these legal frameworks? Um, so the whole problem is that um, the space treaties, we have five core space treaties, all of them are written in general principles. They were, they were all negotiated during the Cold War, they were negotiated at a, a lightning speed for international lawmaking, and they were negotiated, I, I always talk about them as they're kind of like constitutions. They set down values and principles. They're, they're organizing documents the way that a constitution is. And they were set up um, to be longstanding. And we still, you know, as Melissa pointed out, everything that's going on that is contentious keeps being framed as being in accordance with these principles, in accordance with these treaties. Um, but none of the treaties go into, they're not regulatory documents, so they don't go into that kind of detail. They don't regulate activities or behaviour. 
And there's certainly no distinction. Uh, there's certainly nothing about amounts or, you know, there's not even really a distinction between commercial and scientific activities. As long as those are for peaceful purposes, um, there, there are prohibitions, for instance, on uh, establishing a military base on the moon. Um, but you can use military personnel for science, scientific uh, experiments or scientific setups. And that may or may not include commercial, like there's scientific aspects to commercial activity as well. So as long as they are not aggressive, you know, we, it's okay, but then we still have to determine, yes, but is this going against the principle of no sovereignty in space? And I think the, the critical point there is, is the obligation under Article 11.5 of the, the Moon Agreement in terms of seeking to establish a regime. Melissa, um, any observations on that point? I think it's an, it's an interesting question and, of course, it always raises the issue of um, even with taking samples. So there was a, a mission, a Japanese mission, to extract some samples from the Roigu asteroid, which uh, had some quite amazing footage of, of the impact that caused the blowback so that they could capture the samples and questions were raised about but they're destroying the asteroid in order to gain these samples. So, of course resource extraction also raises those sorts of questions. Um, but in terms of, of sample size, no, but it's interesting to know that last year, uh, NASA issued a uh, request uh, for tender for uh, providers to, um, a, to mine or to capture a certain amount of regolith uh, proof of concept, but not, no, need, no requirement to bring it back down to earth, but essentially to, to procure the regolith and to leave it in place. So there are sort of little tests going on all the time about what does it mean and what quantity, you know, will give rise to issues to do with resource extraction. Uh, I mean, utilisation is pretty straightforward, um, but extraction, and, and as we know, there's lots of examples of, of, of rocks and samples having been... Um, been brought back to earth. And I think the other issue that comes along with that is also the one of, um, you know, preservation of the environment. So harm to the environment, harm to the moon's surface, potential harm to the historic sites on the moon, all of those things are also swept up in, in these questions. Can I add just quickly to that? As Melissa pointed out, we can't do anything in space without the commercial sector today. They, they are the ones really pushing the technology. They're doing things faster and better than government pro pro programs can. <coughs> and so that, like, that's what I mean by that blurring between well, what exactly is scientific versus commercial. Maybe they're one and the same sometimes. And also, even if it's not purely scientific, you can always call it scientific. I mean, we've seen that with whaling programs by certain countries where they say, well, we're doing is scientific. So, you know, um, categorizing it may or may not actually speak to the actual activity. Bill? Oh, yeah. I have, if I could go back to the question of the status of the Artemis Accords. I mean, if I have, having had a quick look at them, they certainly don't have the length of treaty language in them, or the language of obligation under a treaty state, such as shall or must. Um, it has the words commit to, but they're followed by words like commit to taking all reasonable efforts. Things, but it quintessentially looks like, to me, an arrangement between two government agencies. It's not actually binding. But leaving that aside, if you can comment on that, but leaving that aside, could you explain just exactly how the Artemis Accords are inconsistent with the new treaty? So, so, so the question, Melissa, was um, what exactly is the inconsistency between the Accords and the, the Moon Agreement? And the question of status. And the question of status. So, so I, you're right, really. It's not, and, and go back to the intent of the party signing it as well. They've said this is not a treaty. There is some language in some of the provisions, some of the sections, which is shall and uh, shall take place. Most of it is, is a, um, a commitment. So if there is any obligation, it's an obligation of effort rather than result. Um, but, but I agree with you. If it's, not, if it's not binding as a treaty, maybe there's no problem at all. Um, but again, I go back to the, the, the language in section 10, if I may, um, which, which, is our, which, which is where I see our conundrum, right? That 
We have an obligation to set up an international regime to regulate these activities. Section 10 says that um, uh, it's the extraction of space resources does not inherently constitute national appropriation. So we assert hereby that it is in accordance with the Outer Space Treaty to extract resources. Um, uh, and that contracts and other legal instruments relating to these should be consistent with the treaty. That, I mean, that's all, that's what we want to hear, right? Uh, and um, this was drafted by NASA. They did make quite some significant changes to the text based on some negotiations with uh, the countries that they wanted to invite to be the first signatories. So, so there was pushback on uh, how that section was actually originally um, written in a little bit more of a forceful way than it now is in the text. So th there's a win already. But just saying that they, they, the extraction of space resources does not inherently constitute national appropriation, um, that, that begs the question. The whole point is that there has been a huge debate about whether extraction of resources can take place given Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, if you look at the Space Competitiveness Act of the US, for instance, where they say, um, we hereby endorse that individuals and, and US citizens, so that includes companies, can extract, use, uh, appropriate, sell, they can do whatever they want with these resources. Um, and some would argue you can't do that unless there is some kind of um, appropriation of that material. So they may not be claiming ownership of the moon, but they are claiming ownership of what they extract. And there's still, there are still some international space lawyers, and I find myself in that camp, who say, I'm not entirely sure. So what we have here is Australia has at least, if it's not the Australian government, there is now a public statement on the flag by the Australian Space Agency that it agrees with this particular interpretation of the, of the Outer Space Treaty. And there are some who don't agree with that interpretation. So uh, I was on a I was at a panel last year, a virtual panel, um, with uh, the Chinese and Brazilian delegates to, to uh, the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, who shared this concern, who said, but this begs the question. And there are many states and many lawyers and other parties, stakeholders, um, who disagree that this extraction can take place under the Outer, Outer Space Treaty as it stands. And you're now saying, we're a club of states that actually argue it does. You know, um, the Chinese delegate said, is this a way of kind of artificially engaging uh, opinion of Europe, which means we can start to say there's some uh, crystallization of customary law, when really what you're saying is if you don't agree with inter this interpretation, you can't be part of our Artemis Club. And so it's, it's not actually a free expression of a state. You're, you're, you're getting parties to start to express this in a certain way um, to, to reach the, um, the result that there will be perhaps a forced international agreement on that interpretation of the treaty. And so that's why I said my concern is about process. It may not be that we have a clash of international obligations, but we do have one particular interpretation which might go against our obligation to set up an international regime because without that, the Outer Space Treaty doesn't allow uh, this kind of activity to take place. Any comments on that, Melissa? Well, I'm probably a slightly in a different place on the spectrum from Cassandra, but I definitely agree that it is not clear. So I, I think that, I, and I also agree with her about what the effect of the, of the Artemis Accords will be in terms of uh, influencing a particular interpretation of international law. So certainly the US is saying you don't have to agree with this interpretation. But as I said, you know, I, I think this issue does need to be resolved. If humanity is to press further into the solar system, we need to come to a resolution on this point. And it's not going to be resolved by not talking about it. And it's not going to be resolved by sending missions to the moon that do engage in research resource extraction without talking about the legitimacy of what they're, what they're doing. And Property lawyers everywhere, you know, have a field day with this because, of course, you know, it takes you back to the, the Lockean concepts of property and taking fish from the sea and all of those sorts of things. All of that is engaged by this debate and we absolutely have to clarify this because it was really never contemplated that it would be necessary to extract resources from the moon. So it wasn't, it wasn't dealt with. What it was worried about was saying nobody can go up there and plant their flag and say, 
the moon belongs to me. And I think, you know, that's, as I say, this is going to engage property lawyers with great enthusiasm about essentially what is meant by that. But, but personally, as I said, I think this is a, a positive step forward. Um, but I also was confused about what Australia's obligations would be. So even if we're, we're at different ends of the spectrum and we still think that it's confusing, then I think we have an issue that needs to be resolved. So we have a, a question that's come in online. Ashley, you were going to oh, paraphrase it. I'll yell it out for everyone here. Yeah. Um, Melissa should be able to see it, I think. So it says, thanks for the discussion. Do you believe there is a risk uh, that with the precedent of the Artemis Accords and the sidelining of the customary pathways to propose and ratify international treaties by the UN, that this could lead to further fracturing of the spacefaring community into several factions that are only bound to whatever agreements members of each group deem appropriate? And secondly, do you think that there is a risk to the outer space treaty if this kind of thinking becomes ingrained? Cassandra? So, um, the second part of the question, no, I don't think there's a risk to the outer space treaty itself, because as I said, it's general principles. It's like our constitution. You know, if we have new technologies or new activities that need to be regulated, we don't change the constitution. We come up with new laws to regulate that, that behavior or that activity. <clears throat> so I don't think the outer, trace, outer space treaty itself is at risk. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole, the crux of this is, this is, is how do we interpret those Cold War generated principles in a 21st century context? And what do we need to come up with to solve those questions? And it, it seems to me that an international legal regime is the perfect way to do that. The problem is who's going to buy into that and what does that regime look like? Because, um, you know, this 2015 uh, competitive, uh, Space Competitiveness Act in the US, under the Obama administration, administration, I think many of us would say, had an international rules, rules based audit in mind still said, you know, we will protect US companies, they have this right. And in some ways, um, they were kind of giving away a property right that they didn't have to give away. Um, so, so the tension point is, is the interpretation. Um, does this process bring under threat the traditional UN pathways? Um, yes, I think it does. Um, the question is, is, is that really problematic? In some ways, yes, it is, because you need negotiations, you need international buy-in, you need some kind of multilateralism, even if that doesn't mean treaties. Um, and this was a concern raised on the panel that I mentioned last year, that by you know, leading delegates of the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space who said, please bring this to COPUS, bring this to the committee. Let's discuss this as an international community. Don't just be setting up your own unilateral interpretation and then deciding who's in on your club. That's not how we want to be moving forward in, in the space sector. Melissa, any thoughts? Yeah, I agree with Cassandra on all of that. Uh, and I, I suppose I, maybe I'm slightly more pessimistic, though, because I think the fracturing is already occurring. I don't think the fracturing is occurring as a, con a consequence, particularly of, of Artemis, um, because I think, as Cassandra said, it, this this pathway had already been commenced in, in 2015 and probably um, prior to that. Um, and I think that, that this is the issue of, of the wonderful outer space treaty. I don't think, again, that the, the, I agree totally with Cassandra that, that the OST itself is not under threat because it is such a broad brush treaty that, in a sense, everybody can, can bring their activities un, under it. But even if you, if you look at sort of different initiatives about how things are approached, so there's been a lot of soft law initiatives, there's been the, the International Code of Conduct, with, which Cassandra mentioned, there has been um, various other approaches, and they even, they, they founder on things like what is the what is the definition that is going to be used for something that is uh, regard, regarded, for example, as a, as a weapon. So you have some interpretations that look at things that come from Earth, other approaches that look at things that are only activated in space. And so these things are already driven by national interest about how they perceive their advantage in the space environment. So looking at it purely you know, not even for, for more altruistic reasons, but purely from the, from the point of view, say, of your commercial space operator. No commercial entity wants to be investing money in moving into a highly dangerous area, which it is very expensive, very, very dangerous to human life, 
difficult even still for robots. And you think about things like lunar dust is, is very corrosive, but to, to then even go into a, into a situation where the security arrangements or the international agreement is, is uncertain is not an environment in which commercial operators want to be present. And so this is why I think, again, you know, Artemis is an agency to agency agreement. It's focused on essentially commercial operators being given some uh, framework within which they can operate. And that's why I do feel that that it is positive because, again, it's, it's forcing people to sit down and think about what is property in space. It's forcing people to sit down and think about do we value the moon and why? And it's forcing people to do exactly what we're doing tonight and which is say, well, what is this? What is this for international law? What does this mean for our use of space? So I, I think it is a positive step forward because it is at least driving the conversation forward and driving it forward in a way that's not talking about military supremacy but is talking about, you know, the future of humanity in space and how can commercial operators work in that environment so I, that's why i think it's it's moving at least it's moving the conversation forward whether we all agree or not can't guarantee that but it's moving it forward thank you other questions uh, from the floor? yes so this is more of a geopolitical question but i think it's relevant to the conversation so with china and russia doing joint collaborations and the criticism is that the accords are very US centric. Do you think competing space agreements and regimes led by other countries will likely emerge in the future? So, so the question is it's geopolitically in focus, uh, is there the potential for other competing space regimes to be developed? I, I guess you're suggesting along the lines of the Artemis Accords being developed by other um, competing space agencies. Yeah, I mean, it goes back a little bit to that previous question of, you know, aren't we threatening the UN pathways and multilateralism? And, and in some ways, it's already happening. Melissa pointed out there is an MOU and a, and a program being developed between China and Russia. Um, um, there's also people doing work on polycentric governance in space. So there's lots of little bits of governance going on that some of which interact explicitly, some of which don't interact directly but may influence each other. And but that's actually fine because we don't have a 20th century version of international law and multilateralism today. Um, what we need is, um, I, you know, I think we need to bolster the, the, the operations of the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space so that we can at least have a place where everyone can come together and speak. Um, but these, the, 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 those agreements are already happening, bilateral, um, you know, quadrilateral, whatever, little, little agreements are happening. Um, um, the influence of the commercial sector is also impacting that. And I think future space governance, and I'm, I mean future in the next five to 10 years, needs to start looking like um, commercial sector, states and international organisations, and maybe even civil society representatives creating ways of, um, of speaking together and coming up with agreements. It's got to be a hybrid form of governance. Your thoughts, Melissa? So I think space has always been a, a place of international rivalry and I think it's fair to say that that international rivalry really had fantastic effects in the 60s. You know, the, I think, you know, the American space program would not have, have happened in the same way that it did without the Russian space program. Uh, I think once uh, humanity got into space, it provided us with a fantastic opportunity to reflect upon ourselves. So if you read a lot of what was said and thought by the by the early astronauts, it was quite a profound reflection on, on the Earth. You know, it was the first time when we had been able to look back on the Earth and reflect upon the wholeness of the Earth um, hanging there in space. I think, so I think a little bit of rivalry is absolutely fine. Um, but I think, again, if you look at the fundamental principles underlying the Outer Space Treaty, what it recognised, what the, the things that were important were the vulnerability of humanity in the space environment and the need to cooperate with one another, the need for, for transparency and, and to, to, um, to be able to inspect uh, and to consult um, the recognition that, in fact, it really was something that was the result of rivalry, but could become a wonderful opportunity for collaboration. And as I say, the best example of that is the International Space Station. And, 
you know, the, the governance agreement for that is really the triumph of, of law uh, over complexity. And it is to be hoped that that sort of approach will be able to, to continue to the, to the Artemis agreement. And I think if we don't, if we don't look at uh, facilitating international cooperation, and if we just allow the commercial operators to do what they're going to do anyway, you only need to look at the enormous number of satellites that have been launched by SpaceX uh, with their program, tens of thousands of satellites in space. Uh, how are we going to deal with such a congested low Earth Earth orbit um, if everybody decides to, to do exactly the same thing. So by its nature, it requires international uh, cooperation, um, but depends a little bit on uh, international rivalry. And again, I do think it's concerning that there is so much focus on the fact that the US has, has sort of made the Artemis agreements uh, open and yet there are other activities that are going on that that people are not open about as i said the the israeli mission that actually crash landed on the moon with um with let, let's say some kind of bio contamination um and the commercial provider who uh, was in charge of that launch quite openly said i don't i don't want to listen to space lawyers i can do what i like so it, it is an environment where we do need international cooperation Thank you. Well, look, um, we've reached the, uh, the end of the hour and um, I don't know whether we've resolved our international law conundrum uh, that we um, have raised. I think we've posed, uh, posed a, a number of additional questions, but I suspect that this is a, a dialogue and a discourse that we're going to be seeing uh, taking place quite uh, frequently um, globally, but also increasingly in Australia over the, over the coming years. So please join me in, in, in thanking our two speakers this evening.